everyone. Good night. Uh, my name's Lara Spear. I am a reporter here at um, Tortoise and welcome to our thinking tonight. Um, I feel like we should do a bit of explaining about why we've actually chosen uh, this topic on a day um, of all days um, and with the political crisis in the government being um, what it is. But we're choosing to discuss tonight um, with some brilliant guests. Uh, the odd couple, as they're called, Keir um, and Angela at the top of uh, the Labour Party. Um, I think this matters. Uh, I think that um, given that Labour has a 10 point lead in the poll, ostensibly at the moment, uh, it's incumbent on us to con con consider the uh, the couple who could soon be, um, you know, one of the most important uh, kind of leadership pairs uh, in British politics. Um, and because these relationships at the top uh, you know, the way that they're reported matters and there's a genuine desire in this newsroom uh, to understand and to chew over um, the reasons why this relationship is being reported in the way that it is, um, whether that's an accurate portrayal um, or not, uh, where the politics of these two um, actually really lies. Um, and to do that tonight, we're going to have three fantastic guests. So Gabby Hinsliff is with us, who's a political columnist, uh, Michael Walker, who is a contributing editor of Novara Media, and John McTernan, uh, who is a political strategist and commentator. So thank you all so much for being with us. Now, Thinking uh, is an open discussion, so we really genuinely want to know what you think. So please, uh, if you have any thoughts on this topic, and I'm sure there'll be many, uh, please do put them in the chat box and I'll try and come to you uh, or raise your uh, digital hand um, and we can come to you that way uh, too. So um, I want to start by, um, going to Gabby Hinsliff. Um, Gabby, um, a fantastic journalist who has written um, a huge amount about both of these characters at the center of tonight's uh, narrative. Gabby, I think if, if possible, I'd quite like to ask, um, to ask you to start this discussion tonight by perhaps reflecting uh, not necessarily on their characters, but on the actual political uh, views or uh, you know, so-called ideology of, mm. of both characters. So you thought a lot about this. Uh, I read uh, a kind of brilliant um, profile that you did of, of Angela Reno, where you do kind of um, refute this idea that there's a binary by which we consider Angela on the kind of left of the party and Keir Starmer on the kind of right of the party. Um, obviously, that's a simplification, but um, I think even in its kind of basis, you consider that actually uh, it, it is a lot more complicated than that. So I wonder if before we get into the kind of uh, the nitty gritty of how this relationship actually uh, has developed over the last year, especially, um, and how the media covers it, whether you or not, you could just say a few words about how you think their political views, um, especially the kind of political journeys to this point, um, have set them kind of either closer together than we might think um, or, or actually quite, quite considerably further apart. Yeah, so quite difficult, there are different sort of political journeys to this point, obviously very different backgrounds. Everyone knows the, the Angela Arena life story um, probably by now, but the fact that she grew up in, you know, in very serious poverty, the daughter of a, of a mother who had bipolar, who for whom she was the primary carer, you know, really grim, grueling, uh, difficult childhood um, and came up through union politics and into the Labour Party. That way represents um, a seat in, national, in greater, sort of the outskirts of Greater Manchester, which is sort of classic white working class seat. And of course, Keir Starmer comes into the party a very different way, you know, a more privileged childhood, although not a posh childhood, I wouldn't say, you know, lower middle class childhood. And comes up through the party and it, it's kind of ushered in very smoothly into the party as a former director of, of public prosecutions. But they're not they're not miles apart politically. You would have put them both. I would say that Keir is probably a bit instinctively to the left of where people think he is. He's not just um, yeah, another Blairite. Uh, he's a sort of what we would have rec recognized once as sort of Ed Miliband-y, soft lefty kind of zone of the party. And I think Angela's probably a bit to the right of where people naturally picture when they when they hear her, when they see her, when they talk, when they see her talking about some issues on which she takes a very different tack to Turkey. She's also one of the few people who has managed from that sort of wing and era and generation of the party that came up under Jeremy Corbyn to mount a convincing defence of Tony Blair's record in government that doesn't immediately put people's backs up. You know, she does a very good pitch, which is without him, you know, it was a it was sure start that taught me to be a parent myself, having had this terrible childhood. And it was Tony Blair's government that put food on my table. And I'm never going to criticise that. So she's a very good way of she has the ability to reach different wings of the party 
and bring them together. So politically, they're not, there's a generational divide, perhaps. I mean, if you hear Angela talk about trans rights, for example, and Keir Starmer talk about trans rights, you can hear the sort of 30 years difference between them, I would say. Um, but this is not, of course, there'll be differences on things, but I don't think there are sort of vast acres to cross. The difference between them is, is personal and stylistic. You know, it's the sense in which they're yin to each other's yang is a polite way of putting it. When it goes well, it's brilliant. You know, you see that they bring very different things to the party and very different styles to the party. When it goes badly, it's as messy as the office that you see behind me. I'm sorry I didn't tidy <laughs> beforehand. Um, so yeah, it, it, it has the potential to explode and it has the potential if you could make it work together, you know, it has the potential to reach far more people than either of them would reach on their own. Mm. And if you look at these kind of ostensible peaks and troughs in their relationship, specifically over the past year or so, the kind of, um, you know, Hartlepool followed by the followed by the sacking, the conference um, and the kind of, you know, so-called scumgate that emerged uh, from that. And then obviously in the November reshuffle uh, where which occurred, you know, ostensibly completely blindsiding um, Angela Rayner. Do you think that it's very clear looking at this kind of period since they both entered these positions um, where where these kind of like high points and low points of their relationships have been or is or is it less nebulous than people than people make out do you think? Everything's always more complicated than the media make out is my basic um, starting point but I think they don't hide neither of them hide and I've interviewed her a few times she doesn't hide that it's difficult actually she doesn't pretend or or you know she'll she'll give you the line about how they have a good working relationship but she won't pretend that there aren't ups and downs and she doesn't conceal her um it's not a word to use about politicians she doesn't conceal hurt easily and I think that's what a lot of their confrontations have about it's not been about factional it's not been you know we're at odds on education policy or, or whatever it is it's been the way she's been treated by the operation you know a reshuffle that happened without consulting the most recent reshuffle that happened without consulting her that totally blinded her that you know she was in the middle she was doing interviews in the morning saying well I don't think there is going to be a reshuffle today ha ha because Keir hasn't told me and literally it, it was then happening she was made made to look as if she was on the fringe of it made to look as if she didn't matter and I think she is she's not sensitive about her position that sounds pompous that's not what I mean but I think she is um sensitive to slights mm. and I and think what, what do you think the motivation in a way that slights her what do you think the motivation in that in that reshuffle episode was from Keir Starmer's team like what, what is the motivation for blindsiding her on that if the differences are not in substance or in policy if you say they are stylistic what does Keir have to gain from blindsiding her in the way that I his think have said that she has I think relations between them can be difficult. I think people in the leader's office find her difficult to deal with. I think there's probably fault on both sides there. And I think that's amplified by the first time I interviewed her, she said something that sort of stuck in my head, which was that she doesn't trust people very easily. And if you came from her, you know, that's a legacy of her childhood. She does not trust people or um, trust people's motives easily. And I think that can sometimes be a cause of friction. And she tends to, um, the sort of the, the, her critics would say, you know, she makes a drama out of a crisis, a thing that happens that's not, you know, it's sometimes on fast moving days, not everyone's across every detail and, you know, it doesn't have to be a big personal drama. Um, and you could come down on the side of that argument, whichever you want to. But I think it is, these are problems that ought to be workable out. You know, they should be problems that can be smoothed out. If both of their offices learned how to deal with each other in the way that the other one needs to be dealt with, shall we say, I think these are problems that could potentially be ironed out. Okay, and John McTernan, who's another of our of our guest political strat uh, strategist and commentator, I've just seen that you've said in the chat, John, are you there, that she wasn't blindsided in that instance. Can you just explain a bit what you mean by that? Yeah, she was involved in the um, discussions about who should be uh, reshuffled. Um, she was consulted. She's involved uh, in, in the senior leadership decision making. Um, there was, she had a speech. The reshuffle got out while she was making her speech 
Um, now, everybody knows who's in politics that the speech is covered before the speech. Uh, you have to, the caravan moves on, some other news had to happen. I don't know who it was that um, let the news, the reshuffle coming out. And the most difficult thing in a reshuffle is your sackings. The people you sack are more likely to leak that they're being sacked or being moved than anything, than any other thing. But um, I know from, from both offices that um, uh, she wasn't blindsided by uh, by that, but she but she didn't want to say anything when asked, um, yeah, there's a reshuffle, I'm confirming there's a reshuffle, the reshuffle isn't a thing for her to do. So the, uh, I think that was flammed up in that kind of period when um, there was a lot of focus on the relationship between the two of them. Um, I think the, the, the fact that um, Keir Starmer is unassailably the leader of the Labour Party and there's no vacancy, there won't be a vacancy until he decides there's a vacancy, which is when he steps down from being Prime Minister, has settled everything at the top of the office uh, and that reshuffle was actually fundamental in that, not just um, the removals, but also the promotions. Uh, and that team uh, is part of the solicitude which led to the confidence to do this combined type of PMQs between the two of them uh, on Boris Johnson, which has been part of the persistence uh, together with the Daily Mirror and together with um, uh, the Friends of the Labour Party who work in number 10 who are getting the stories out. Um, that's led to the crisis that the, the government are in, from which it looks unlikely uh, that the Conservative uh, Party will actually recover. Their brand is now tarnished. Um, they won't get the fifth term that they're seeking. Um, and in that situation, uh, you know, the, the relationship between the leader and deputy leader is transformed because it is now, how are we going to govern together? It's a Blair Prescott thing. It's not a Ed and whoever he had as his deputy leader, you know, because it's irrelevant because Ed and his deputy leader were never going to have to discuss what real power was about. Okay, so to your mind then, it's uh, it's actually, it's you know, she wasn't blindsided. It's actually a much more constructive working relationship than you think has been reported and recent kind of deterioration in the effectiveness of the government you think uh, will... like I know, uh, she tells a story and uh, it's a good story during during a lockdown when very few staff were coming in but politicians were going and she was she was in her office Keir was in his office and she was doing a, uh, a meeting with some journalism students a zoom meeting and they were asking her what's your relationship like with with the other guy because they obviously had this picked up on the story and um at the time she's trying to answering that question Kira opened the door, walked in and said, do you want a cup of tea? Um, and she kind of went, that's my relationship. So I kind of think um, this thing can be overstated. Gabby gave a very good sketch uh, of the fact that the, the politics between them can be overstated. And the truth is, when she chose to run for deputy leader, uh, and when a lot of people uh, on my side of the party voted for her, we knew what that meant. That meant that Corbynism was over. Uh, she wasn't running for leader. She'd have been quite, a, you know, that would be a different leadership contest had she chosen to run against him. And so everybody understands what Angela running for deputy leader meant. Mm. meant she did back her back along Bailey, though, didn't she? Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, the, num the, 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 the number of people who voted Ian Murray won and, um, uh, but we're happy to transfer uh, to Angie Rayner. It's quite substantial. Mm, okay, interesting. Well, well, I'll come back to you. I just want to bring in Michael quickly, if that's possible. Michael Walker is contributing editor at um, Navarra Media. I'm quite keen to get into your perception of how this relationship is covered and these briefing wars. I think we've already seen tonight this idea that actually the relationship is quite substantially different to how people in the media might see it or might read it as um, being betrayed. And in kind of thinking about how we do this thinking, um, we were talking about the fact there's kind of a genuine desire to understand where these reports come from, what the role of the media should be in interpreting and covering this relationship constructively. Um, and listening to John speak then about kind of whether or not the recent um, crisis in the conservative leadership is, is gonna bring this relationship into a kind of more harmonious tread. Um, I think that the question I kind of really want to get to the bottom of is, 
is 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 this relationship therefore going to be better if you still have i mean even you know in the last few days you have these reports of well Keir said he wants to get rid of the title of deputy leader and, and angela's team have said have said x next have, have come back and obviously the a lot of the time the publications that cover this you might argue have an interest in making this relationship seem perhaps more fractious than it actually is i just wonder what role you think the media might play in how this relationship has been presented um, well, I suppose in a way, I think the media respond a lot to the briefings from the from the pair of them. So, I mean, I I, I think I, I, I agree with um, John and and Gabby that the relationship is not going to be a barrier to them getting into power because basically they'll brief against each other when things are going bad because they will want to blame each other, and when it looks like things are going well, they're not going to brief against each other because they've got nothing to blame the other one for. So, so I, I can't see a situation where Labour are ahead in the polls, an election is going to come around the corner, and then suddenly Angela Rayner says. Oh, actually, I don't want Keir Starmer to be prime minister and me to be deputy prime minister, so I'm going to throw a spanner in the works. So, I mean, the relationship seems to be going well now because Labour are doing okay in the polls. The relationship was disastrous last summer because Labour were doing very poorly. Um, so, I, in a way, I think it's kind of as, as simple as that in the question of will it stop them getting into power? I do think the relationship, though, you can take a step back and have a sort of broader perspective on what it says about the Labour Party and the different factions in it. And if things do start to go badly, which I think is you know, very much possible, um, I know John's convinced Keir Starmer will be the next prime minister. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hedging my bets still, let's just say that. <laughs> um, but they do, I mean, I agree their politics aren't that far apart potentially. I don't think either of them are particularly ideological people, but they definitely represent different strategies and, and they, they've taken on different positions within the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, I think after getting elected on an incredibly dishonest platform, it turned out to be, is, is very, very happy to say anyone who was remotely interested in Corbynism, anyone who was remotely inspired by that, they're not part of the project. I'm willing to, you know, just exclude them all, expel them all. And I'm going to hope um, that sort of winning over some people from the newspapers or whoever is enough that I won't get attacked so much that I need them. Um, Angela Rayner, I think, recognises that her career actually is much more bound up in left-wingers in trade unions and much more bound up in uh, a left-wing Labour Party membership. Because while John says she's not actually that left-wing, her, her, uh, sort of her, her role in that job, and if she ever were to become leader, that would be on the basis that she is more acceptable to the left than Keir Starmer because she is... And, and whoever is likely to face her, let's face it, if that's Wes Streeting or, or whoever, because she, unlike that wing of the party, isn't, doesn't hate the left. You know, she, she hasn't built a career out of defeating the left before you do anything else. And Keir Starmer has surrounded himself now with people for whom that, that is their perspective. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree. I think it won't stop them getting into power because they both want to get into power. They're ideologically not that different but their power bases are quite different and Angela Rayner's is much more left-wing than, than Keir Starmer's at this point in time. And in that, in, in that vein do you not do you not ever feel like it's in Keir's interest um, through through these kind of briefing wars etc to at least seem like he's distancing himself in some way from Angela Rayner's political ideology or at least if you look at these kind of procedural examples of where there seems to have been some some sort of conflict if you look around kind of Labour conference for example these areas where it seems like it's quite difficult to get them to sing from the same hymn sheet all the time do you, is there is there a sense especially among people in the left of the party that there is there is a kind of Angela can be occasionally scapegoated or 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 in order to kind of shore up credibility among people who aren't maybe traditionally Labour voters, Angela is in some way seen as kind of a, a, something that has to be a, a kind of individual in, in the shadow cabinet that has to be dealt with more delicately. Um, I mean, I suppose to look at it another way, I suppose I, I think the way Keir Starmer has reacted to Angela Rayner and I don't think, you know, I, I think if Angela Rayner was leader and she was calling Tory scum, et cetera, et cetera, she's a they're both actually very new politicians. Neither of them have that much experience and they make a lot of unforced errors, both of them. But I, I think the way Keir Starmer handles Angela Rayner is very similar to the way that he's handled basically the whole left of the party, which is with very, very little intellectual confidence. So when Angela Rayner called the Tories scum at Labour Party conference, if I was Keir Starmer, I, I think it's fine to say, look, I wouldn't use those words. That's not the kind of politician I am. But this is Angela Rayner. You know, it's great that we have people in the Labour Party who feel this passionate. We're quite different. It's why we make this great team. 
instead he sort of said looks incredibly awkward sort of like oh, i can't possibly be associated with anything which isn't my brand my brand is centrist my brand is safe my brand is nothing is remotely scary and i can't be seen to be remotely near anything whereas i think if he had the intellectual confidence to say it's not what i'd do but it's totally fine that that's in the party and you know i think that's what he should have done with with jeremy corbyn it's not what i would have said but it's totally it's, it's brilliant that that section of the population is also in our party we're a broad tent but Keir Starmer, I think, hasn't had that intellectual confidence to do that. And you've seen that with Angela Rayner, who's obviously willing to forgive him because she's still deputy leader of the party and she wants to be deputy prime minister. But there will be many people, I think, well, definitely within the Labour Party membership, but also, I think, in the electorate who are not going to forgive him for, for having distanced himself so aggressively, I think, from anyone who doesn't fit within what is his very constrained notion of, of what a successful politician should be. Gabby, do you, what do you think, do you agree that Keir Starmer potentially overprizes political homogeneity among the leadership? I think he has to be, I mean, I think where I agree with Michael is he has to be careful not to sort of squish the life out of her and, and by doing so, you know, negate everything she she brings to the party the side that you know with her sort of the fact that she's incredibly engaging that she talks in a in a very natural register that she speaks to people that he doesn't that he can be a bit stiff and dull to be honest and that she's really not you know with the fact that she wears her heart on the sleeve comes the fact that sometimes she says things and you just think oh no. but actually I think you are denying her agency in a way by suggesting that she was completely she was just shut down by Keir in his terrible way because I mean I I talked to her about that about that whole incident in a, in a recent interview I did with her. And she was, firstly, it wasn't just Keir who thought that scum stuff was awful. It was, you know, it came after, if you think about the context in which it came, the murder of Dave Amos, every MP in the Commons is thinking about the language that's used about them, the language they might have used in the past. You know, we're all going through in the same way as you did after the murder of Joe Cox, that thing of, you know, maybe we cannot use dehumanizing language about other people. She was at home on leave, having lost someone she regarded as like a mother to her. You know, she her emotions were very raw, very much on the surface. And she said to me very honestly, and I believed her, you know, I would have felt mortified. She's getting messages from other MPs going, what are you doing? You know, and she said to me, she felt mortified to think that she could have any way, in any way, contributed not meaning to not in any way meaning to you know encourage anyone to violence but to think that she could have somehow been part of a perception that she was you know and I think I don't think that apology was forced out of her by Starmer I think that came from her and I think it illustrates something that's a real strength in her is she will make mistakes but she learns from them quicker than an awful lot of other politicians I've I've met you know she may be less of the sort of polished article than Kia, who's had all these years of practice in public life, you know, but she, but she learns extremely quickly and she becomes a better politician as a result of the mistakes she makes. And that is like a really rare, unusual and special quality. That's the one you think, okay, that one's, <laughs> that one's going somewhere. So I think in that case, it wasn't a case of him squishing her, but I agree that, you know, there are times when he will want her to fall in line and actually it could be useful to them that she doesn't fall in line and that was the same dynamic that you saw you know with Blair and Prescott quite often you know John will be John okay he thumped a couple of voters you know but but that that in a mm. in a sense you know the fact that he wasn't Tony Blair was his was his his raison d'etre. Mm. And how useful do you think when looking at these relationships, these historical comparisons to former kind of political pairs at the top of British politics are? Do you think there are any that are kind of largely comparable or do you think that Kieran and Angela are, are pretty unique? Are there lessons you think we can kind of glean? They're different. I mean, they're different. The sort of the Blair Prescott model is someone who absolutely has no ambitions of their own and desperate and just, you know, really totally wants to to support the person to whom they're leader. And yes, they have differences. You know, they did have they did have big proper policy differences from time to time and it could get um, hairy behind the scenes but he never ever ever wanted rid of Blair and he never had ambitions to replace Blair and you know Harriet Harman who was deputy leader to, to Gordon and then to to Ed Miliband um, again didn't want to replace either of them I think 
afterwards, later, she may have said to herself, if I was a bloke, would I have run for leader and not just been content with the deputy? But that's not what she wanted to do at the time. And she did have a separate agenda to them, but it wasn't factional. It was a feminist agenda with which neither of them was going to necessarily argue, but they probably wouldn't have done it by themselves. And they needed a bit of a kick up the backside about it. So those were those were sort of different models. Then you get the sort of Tom Watson, Jeremy Corbyn model, which I think is, let's just say, probably a leader deputy model that no one wishes to emulate again just constant psychodrama um and this one is a is a different one all over again in that Angela Rayner does I think think she's capable of leading she does see herself as a potential possible leader one day who knows maybe you know if Labour were to lose the next election and people were to think it's because the leader is a bit stiff and boring then maybe they would rather have you know so on. so it's not that she has no ambition and that is what makes the dynamic between them interesting, because I think, you know, Keir's office is um, more than aware of that. Mm-hmm. I think so. I'm just I'm keen to bring in William Jeremy, if I might, who's making an interesting point in the chat. But first, John, if I can bring you in as someone in the eye in the storm and kind of what many people consider one of the most interesting periods of a really political relationship between two powerful people. So the 2005 to seven period where you direct to political operations in the Blair government, um, it would be useful. It'd be useful if you could talk a bit about whether or not you think there are any, because I think all of us or many of us will have seen um, the documentaries and we'll be thinking a lot about whether or not these relationships are in any way comparable. Um, What do you think there is to learn from that from that period of your time uh, at the centre of it all? Or do you think that this is this is something that's that's totally different? Oh, look, this is totally different. There are the analogy is with with, with JP um, and the warning from history is actually Angela should not try to have a super ministry because that destroyed John Prescott. If John had actually, if he'd, if he'd just done one of the three, de- if he just had one of the departments, if he'd done transport and done it well, if he'd done uh, communities and local government and done it well, um, he would he would have hit the ground running at the beginning of the of, 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 of the of the Blair government. I think the issue about 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 Gordon was look. Um, I remember being in a meeting with, with Tony and somebody said look. Uh, somebody in the office was going, oh, look, Tony, the problem with Gordon is he wants to be prime minister. And Tony just leant back and he went, yeah, well, it's not an ignoble ambition, is it? Um, and, you know, am- a- ambition is a good, it's a driver of politicians, it's an energy of politicians. Um, and back in the middle of the Brexit saga, when Boris was knocking off Theresa May, I remember speaking to senior civil servants, and they said, we used to think that you guys were dysfunctional. We used to think that you guys had differences. I mean, so politics has changed a lot. The, what was the difference between Brown and Blair is, is minuscule. And I think the what I thought watching the the, the, the documentary was actually um, that one of the biggest changes never talked about because it, it was about the men, it was about the the, 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 the relationship between the two men, is that in 1997, everybody looks young and there's only one woman in the shadow cabinet and one woman then in the cabinet. And actually... Harriet Harman has changed the face of British politics, but because the story is told through the boys, she never gets the credit for actually the fact that the House of Commons is full of men and women of colour. It's almost half women. Uh, it, the, the transformation, it's been so radical that we don't almost notice looking back. So there, there's more than one way to make a political impact, I think is what I'm saying there. And that Angela Rayner needs to have a project. Prescott had a project. Prescott actually was always proud of having been the guy that invented PFI, um, because that's how he was going to finance uh, the new rolling stock for the railways. So that if you have an have an have an have a program, Keir's going to have a program. Keir's program is going to be to make make politics boring again, which a lot of people be happy with. Angela brings a different kind of character to that, but she needs to kind of know what's the thing that I'm going to take into government and pursue and do in government. Uh, and you can only ever do one or two things. You mm-hmm. can't have a hundred things that you're going to do. Is there any uh, indication, do you think, of what that might be for her? No, because I, I, to be honest, um, I think um, the, for the whole of the shadow cabinet, that for me is the question, which is, we get you, not the other guys. You've all got to work out what is the question about the future of Britain to which you are the answer or you're part of the answer and what is that thing? And that's what this next period is about. Labour shouldn't be sweating about when the Sue Gray report comes out, Labour should be sweating about what is the frame that we're imposing on politics? What is the way we see the next 25, 30 years as a challenge and how can we rise to it? And the, you know, 
and there's something to learn from from, from Michael and Navara and the, the 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 energy of thinking that's still around on the left the Corbyn Corbyn did unleash in the Labour Party um, and that that the the mainstream of the Labour Party does not for me have the enthusiasm energy or interest in policy discussions uh, that I get uh, on the left of, on the left of the party still get from the left of the party mm -hmm. so I think that's a space that Angela could occupy uh, and be really interesting in because she she does come from a different political tradition and she does come from a different political home and you know, in, in the end, they've got to work out how to be the Astaire and Rogers of modern politics, haven't they? Mm. Michael, can I ask you in, in, in that kind of vein, given that, um, that as, as John just said, that there is, there is difficulty with um, those on the left like yourself who've brought so much energy to the movement with kind of relating and, and fully throwing your weight behind Keir Starmer, do you think there's any way in which Angela Reyna could form a kind of tangible bridge? Or do you think that some of the actions of the last year among Starber and the leadership's office have kind of irreparably burned some of those bridges for people who've brought so much energy to this movement. What do you think about that kind of bridge with Corbynism? Uh, I suppose, well, I mean, it depends with whom. I, I mean, I think, feel like the last, uh, the actions over the last couple of years will have irreparably damaged a lot of relationships. Obviously, there will be some people who, you know, if the Keir Starmer government seems possible, then no one's going to, you know, forego the chance of advising how to spend 26 billion pounds a year on a green new deal because you know Keir Starmer was an asshole two years earlier but uh, whether that will happen is also a different is also a different question because I, I do think to have that sort of interesting policy going into government you do need to have some of the people who were the energy behind that policy involved and I think Keir Starmer and the people around him have, have essentially locked all of them out and I do also think this is going to be probably well one of their biggest barriers to getting into power that they have pissed off people so badly. I was reading, there's, there's a comparison between Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden, which I thought was quite good, where it's saying, when Hillary Clinton beat Bernie Sanders, it wasn't, she, her, her argument wasn't, look, we disagreed, but I've won. He's got a legitimate politics. I've got a legitimate politics, but I'm now the one who's running for president. He's welcome in my coalition, but he's got to accept that I'm, I'm the top dog here. Instead, she said, they're all Bernie bros. They're all misogynists. They shouldn't be anywhere near power, et cetera, et cetera. Keir Starmer, and then, sorry, Joe Biden did quite the opposite. He said, look, I beat Bernie Sanders, but I beat him fair and square. We have different politics. I'm a centrist, but the people who backed Bernie, they're very welcome in my coalition as well, as long as they accept their junior partners. Now, that's what I wanted Keir Starmer to do. I mean, I didn't vote for him because I didn't trust he would, but my hope was that that's what he would do, is to say, look, I'm, I'm the top dog now. I'm not Jeremy Corbyn. I'm leader of the party, and I've got a very different set of priorities. But... Um, you know, the other guys are also legitimate participants in, in politics, and I'm going to accept them in my coalition as junior partners. Instead, what he did is say, these are all scum. They're all racists. They should have no role in politics whatsoever. I mean, you saw Rachel Reeves saying this the Financial Times last week. It's good that I've got less members in my party, um, in my local party, because they didn't share Labour values anyway. You know, on the same day that they've let someone cross the floor from the Conservative Party, which, by the way, I don't have a particular problem with. I think Labour should be a big tent party. We're a first past the post system. But they have refused to do that. And I do think that that is going to be a little bit irreparable. Once you call people sort of racist scum, it's very difficult for them to sort of swallow their pride and rejoin the coalition if they're ever invited. Do you think that Keir has plans were he to win an election, kind of continuing the whole Biden example and the integration of, of AOC and some of her colleagues into the many of the legislative processes around this, do you think there's any sense within Keir's team of, I need to be seen to be sidelining the left of the party in some public way, but I have every intention of integrating them, come a government, or I have every intention of trying to find a way to make a kind of more, a truly inclusive or broad tent government feasible? Well, I mean, I suppose you can... If you were to be the most optimistic, so if I were to say, oh, this could be the strategy and this would be, you know, I still think it's somewhat unpleasant and unnecessary, but it wouldn't, you know, but, but it would have some decent outcomes. If they said, look, Keir Starmer is secretly left wing. He's just not going to tell anyone yet. He's going to spend this, this sort of phased, phased approach, which sort of Paul Mason talks about. And I'm sure, you know, to some extent it's, it's the case where they thought the first thing we need to do is detoxify the Labour Party. That involves being really rude and horrible to hundreds of thousands of people. Um, after we've done that, then we'll say, this is Keir Starmer. He looks a bit like a prime minister. And then 
will come up with a policy program which has enough sort of radical baubles to to bring back young people to bring back people who are tempted to vote green you know things like free tuition fees a, a sort of big statement that isn't going to lose your voters but might win you back the people who you've pissed off over the previous three years and you know potentially that's what they're considering potentially Rachel Rees wants to spend the 26 billion pound a year on, on something good I mean it's possible but it requires a lot of um it requires that you have a lot of faith because they haven't done anything really to demonstrate that's their plan all they've done since they've got in power is insult that that half of of, of the the Labour Party and the people who wanted to vote for them so I, I just see it as um it's possible I'm, I'm not ruling it out but I think it's unlikely obviously if he, if that was the plan it would be better than when Joe Biden did it because it's much easier in our system to, to pass those yeah. policies he wouldn't get screwed over by you know Joe Manchin but um, <laughs> it, it requires it requires having a lot of faith because he hasn't given us any confidence let's say right okay interesting and William Jeremy if I can bring you in William is in the chat and is making actually quite a similar point um around kind of building up broad coalitions but I don't know where I think yours comes from a kind of it seems like you're more on the other side of the argument potentially where you think that actually it's incumbent on somebody like um, Keir Starmer to make sure that he is very, very alert to what might be a more electorally salient position? Uh, I I think it's, uh, and by the way, I've got a bit of a wonky internet connection, so okay. I might go at any right. moment, but it's just to say that historically, of course, our political system has these broad coalitions that's what our party system has been about and uh, it uh, brings forth these big personalities and clashes of experience and of life circumstances and of opinion and in a way for me uh, Keir Starmer you could have put him in Clement Attlee's cap and just imagine Keir Starmer with a Homburg hat and a coat and you know he's got that um th that classic uh lame uh, in both opposition and government way and his profile as uh as uh, as the public prosecutor and similarly angela rayner could be a bomb with a castle of our day um intemperate sometimes but uh as gabby was saying very much learning from her her mistakes uh and let us remember that uh, a lot of the press comments around the time she had that out outburst people were remembering that Be that nye benven said uh, that he thought the Tories were lower than vermin. Now, in a context, that's totally understandable for, say, someone like Nye ben Benven to say, say that. And it said, and I don't know whether John would agree with this or not, it said that that did damage Bevan's uh, political reputation thereafter but uh that's you know, i mean that the, these these big passionate things are are said i suppose it's a mark of our the way politics has been conducted in the last 20 years say that that sort of language does does startle us in a way that it might not 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 have done 35 years ago 50 years ago mm. so it's a matter of bringing talent in as well and i think she's a talent and i think and andrew and kia need to to find a way of working more closely together Mm. John, that, did that's you... a bit rambly, but you know. no, no, it's okay. I mean, you asked whether John. It'd be interesting to hear John what, what you did think about that, and whether or not you think there's more of a continuity in the way that language is used in politics than this traditional narrative of civility's gone down the drain might necessarily be suggesting. I mean, this kind of vision of Angela as 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 Camilla Tomini wrote today in the Telegraph, you know, a, a wild card and kind of you know she's 
she has the potential to be so brilliant but th there is to me at least maybe this slight element in the coverage that is ever so slightly sexist where it's this kind of idea of like she could be an enigma but Keir's kind of you know got it under control and he'll be sensible and prosecutorial and precise and at the dispatch botch or whatever and and I wonder if we do almost both of them a discredit by polarizing the way that they appeal to people in in that way so there's two separate questions there one around language and then the other one around this kind of like this looping in this idea of civility into the discussion around the discourse around Angela Rayner to me does seem a little bit dangerous yeah look on the on the discourse um I think the big issue for us is we have seen what the polarization of discourse and language can lead to in violence we've had two MPs murdered uh, in the recent period uh, and before that uh, we you know before the war in Northern Ireland was, was sorted there were there was a, a very a successful attack on Downing Street that the, the, the back of Downing Street has still got the marks left on it they were the mortar hit it because John Major wanted to make sure that everybody who used Downing Street and in, were in the garden uh, could see that it had been subject to a massive attack um, the so that we and we see in Trump, we see in America where the discourse led to the riot and the attempt to overthrow an election. So I think we're a lot more cautious now, correctly, about about using language loosely and othering people. And I think that's actually been a benefit for our politics. Um, and I think there was a slip back after Brexit when people started to talk to, to act out as though they could say the same things. Uh, about um, black and, and minority ethnic people in the UK that they thought the political correctness had stopped them from saying, and you see a slippage in the Conservative Party trying to uh, its war on woke. We know we know what that's about. It's a discourse of racism masquerading as something else that is dangerous. Uh, it was rejected when they tried it on the um, uh, on the England football team. And I think the country is much more liberal than the Tory party believe it is, but the, the discourse is dangerous to allow to allow the slippage in the language. I think that's why Angela was right, and, and I agree with Gabby, was personally mortified by what she'd said and apologised freely, fully, uh, completely uh, about using, using the term that she'd used at conference. In terms of Angela herself, like I think you, you, your second point, there is, in the way that Angela's talked, misogyny and patriarchy. Like, it's a patriarchal attitude towards her. It is, you can't be a woman and be serious. You can't be a woman and look like that and be serious. It is just absolutely, it's, just, it's the, uh, it, it's still there. You can change the House of Commons, you can just look at the House of Commons, but you've, but the patriarchy is not dead yet. Um, and I think that's a, that, that, that is a thing that every leading female politician uh, in the UK has to deal with in a way that male politicians don't have to deal with. Um, and it's, and you, can, you, can, you can flam it up in all the way you want, you know, here's prosecutorial and logical and all these things and Angela's therefore by definition, um, what is she? She's emotional, she's not intellectual. She, I, um, so I think, uh, and I think that she exploits that. Was the, the clever thing about her is that she turns that on. His, so, so when she um, when she's there at the scratch box, uh, deputising for Kier, she leans into that. She kind of goes, "Come!" When basically at the end of it, you feel like she's going to go, "Come on, then, come on, come on." Um, and that that is bringing a bit of a bit of style uh, and substance. Um, and confrontation into the commons to say like you treat me like that well you don't want me to you don't want to see me respond to you like that mm. and I think that's and, and so I think uh, that's why I, th what I do think in the end she's going to have to have a program an idea a thing that she takes through the government that she that is her contribution uh, but I but I, I, I don't think I, I, I do think it was bad for Nibev and what he said, and I don't think it would be a good idea to bring that kind of attitude towards the Tories. We want Tory voters to vote for the Labour Party. Um, otherwise, we'll have Tory governments forever. Mm. And I'm, I'm keen to come to Terry in a second, but I would love Gabby to pick up on that point, if if possible, this question of sexism as it relates to Angela Rayner. And I think John's point about her being able to lean effectively 
into this, especially her performance at the Dispatch Box recently um, against Boris Johnson deputising. I wonder if, especially in, in your dealings with her, you've had more insights into the way in which she has been able to kind of use that the kind of narrative that's been brought against her, especially. And do you think that there is a particularly unique way? I mean, Terry, who I hope will come to, is making this point about it's not just sexism, but it's also classism. Do you think that she yeah, she, she has she she faces these challenges that women do in a particularly unique way? She given deals with both snobbery and misogyny, and that's you know that's been true ever since she's come to the Commons, and she's got better and better at dealing with it. But you know, every time she says anything in the dispatch box, you know, social media fills up afterwards with stuff about how she's thick because of her accent or how she you know she gets flung back at her well you left school with no her levels pregnant you know she she's constantly patronized on both counts both on being a woman and on being a working class woman and I think she has learned to turn that to her advantage in two ways I think she would say she always says it's really helpful that people underestimate her because then you whack them around the chops and they don't know what's hit them you know and I think she's very good at um, doing that. Secondly, I think she disconcerts Boris Johnson. I don't think he knows how to, how th this may sound an odd thing in context of what we know about Boris Johnson. <laughs> I don't think he knows how to talk to women, except <laughs> I think he knows how to talk to them about one thing, shall we say, but not about many others. And I think mm -hmm. he's discomforted by facing her across the dispatch box in a way he's not by men. There's this woman, you can't sleep with it. What do you do? You know, and 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 I think she does um, use that. They, they also, I think he enjoys um, looking at them both. I think he enjoys PMQs with her more than he enjoys PMQs with Keir Starmer. And that's not because I think he finds one more difficult than the other. It's a proper, you know, it's a proper set too, and they both spark off each other somehow. You know, those, those yeah. cats have have much more energy. So I think she is, she's done her best at, you know, at turning those things, at blunting the edges of those things when they're used as weapons against her. But I don't doubt that it's um, difficult. And I don't doubt that it's, you know, that there is a wearing barrage of stuff that comes her way. And it just, it's just the basic stuff. Still now, even she will yeah. say, she'll walk into a room and people will talk to her um, male aides before they talk to her. Mm. And that's as deputy leader of the Labour Party, yeah. you know, and, and that's just something that she, you deal with on a daily basis. So do I you think the coverage of the relationship would be different if the genders were switched around? If you had a female leader and a male yeah. deputy leader, Oh, yeah, that would be an interesting dynamic. Then Harriet Palman always used to say, it's worth giving a go. We've done the other one for yeah. long enough. Uh, <laughs> one that we hope. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, I'm keen to come to Terry, if possible. Are you there, Terry? You made this point about the intersection of of class um, and sexism in the way that the media portrays Angela Rayner and particularly this relationship. Could you talk a bit about the, just flash out the point you were making in the chat? Cause it's a bit of a long one, but I haven't, it'd be good to hear it in a bit more detail. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm a bit nervous, but um, yeah, the, the, the point that I was kind of trying to get across was was that um, Angela Rayner is, is a bit like a breath of fresh air in terms of um, the way she sounds, and um, I think Zebedee said her like passion, um, and I think that comes from a really genuine, unrehearsed place, um, and I think it is really down to earth, um, and I know that's a bit of a cliche term, but, um, and I think that that's for some it's a breath of fresh air and other people I think it's it's a bit threatening and and new and too new for some people and I think it it's shaking up the status quo a little bit um so I'm not, I'm not sure that it's all to do with sexism although I do kind of agree that you know that that is probably a massive part of it in terms of why some people find her grating or or something but I, I think it is mainly to do with um, yeah, the fact that she's, her, her demeanor, it's unrehearsed and it's new and it's, it's some, something you don't really hear every day. I mean, I really enjoyed her prime minister's questions when I heard it because I felt like there was a passion there. Um, and, and I think that it's a bit threatening for some people who, who find it hard to accept that maybe someone who isn't middle class or upper, upper mm -hmm. class can have strong, passionate um intelligent views and have some sort of kind of leadership authority mm -hmm. yeah it's a really good point and people agreeing with you in the chat saying that 
that it is a breath of a, a breath of fresh air. She doesn't seem to come across like other politicians. Joe says that can be an asset, and I think I, I definitely agree. I mean, even today, I was looking at these. I was kind of just looking at how the coverage of Angela ranged from day to day, and I, I actually genuinely, and I, you know, I'm interested in politics and read about it a lot. I could not believe some of the articles about Angela's, you know, writing about what Angela wears, her fashion sense, the kind of her her bold style, etc. I mean, it was just. I, I do think it is unique, even in even in a realm where women still experience a lot of discrimination. Um, regardless, I do think that there is a there is a particular way in which the media have covered Angela, in which I think we should acknowledge when we're discussing this tonight. And I, I'm very keen because I, I can see it getting on, but I'm desperate to ask some of our guests as well as people here uh, about the current political crisis and how Kira and Angela together are going to approach it. Um, I think obviously people have been um, quite complimentary about Keir Starmer's performance in that performance in the House of Commons recently, um, some others who are saying, you know, it's it, it's not particularly difficult given the mess that Boris has got himself in to be performing well um, at the at the current uh, stage. But John, I'm quite keen to ask you um, something that's come up a little bit. I was reading Keir Starmer wrote this um, piece, I'm sure you saw it in the Huffington Post today, um, where he kind of made a slight change of, of tact from going from just attacking Boris Johnson, and this is something we've heard Strash just say before, that kind of one of the big criticisms of, of Keir so far has been we've personalised Boris Johnson too much from the Labour benches to the extent that if he leaves, uh, you know, the Conservatives will be a clean slate and they'll be able to just govern and say we've got rid of Boris Johnson. It's not about the Conservatives, it's about him, the sleaze, the, the culture, everything we've seen, it starts with him. Um, Keir's article today, um, I'm sure you saw it, but really kind of pinned the national insurance tax hike on Rishi Sunak's shoulders and said, you know, we know that he's going out there saying this is the Prime Minister's tax, but it's Rishi Sunak's tax. Um, and I wonder if you're getting a sense of a change in tax slightly slightly from Keir and perhaps also um, from Angela. And and when, this, when the strategy is so delicate like it is uh in, in messaging around this when you're kind of anticipating a potential leadership change on the opposite benches in the government you can feel that you're edging ahead in the polls kind of coordinating and making sure that the two of them sing from the same hymn sheet must be extraordinarily difficult i'm just wondering if, if you've noticed a slight change in their messaging what you anticipate the way in which labor strategy will kind of play out in the coming days obviously we could see sue gray tonight probably tomorrow in the next few days i'm just what i mean obviously it's anyone's guess but i know you're doing a lot of media today tomorrow <laughs> so perhaps you do have some thoughts uh, on how you think this will this will pan out and and what the best way possible you think for labor to, to capitalize on this might be I mean, the best way possible is to let them carry on making their own mistakes, right? Um, if Rishi Sunak wants to be a successful leader of the Tory party and therefore win an unprecedented fifth term at when he becomes leader succeeding Boris Johnson, he's got to show a lot more bottle than he's showing at the moment. He should not be going around the back bench just saying, I know that budget I presented, I was forced to do it. A big, you know, a big boy did it and he ran away. Um, it's his budget, he's got to own it, he was, you know, it's not his mixed rise, it's also not his furlough money, which is it? Um, so Labour, Labour are definitely trying to, to drag the brand damage from the Prime Minister onto the Conservative Party and onto all the people sitting around the table who could stop him, who knew, like, who, you know, like, you go into the cabinet and you say, hands up, who is surprised that this is the crisis that Boris Johnson has created? Not a single hand will go up. Um, and that's the issue. You have to stretch this across them. And the problem for Rishi in particular, but also for the other leadership, the leadership contenders in the cabinet is if they wanted to stop it, if they wanted a vote of no confidence in the prime minister, they can just resign from the cabinet. And they're worried they wouldn't win it. They're worried that the party wouldn't choose them. They're worried more about their position than what is good for the country and in the end what is good for government and what is in the end good for the Conservative Party in the long run. Um, as a Labour supporter and a Labour member since uh, the 1970s, I'm happy just to see the show running. But the Labour Party is shifting to uh, there's nobody around that table with clean hands. Uh, and I think that's mm -hmm. the right place to go to mm -hmm. uh, because it is, you know, we're going to go into the election election saying, there's three thousand uh, pounds household being paid extra in tax. Has the NHS been saved in your neighbourhood? Mm. Mm. Gabby, can I ask you the same question about what you think Labour should be doing? Because I think although everybody's getting extremely excited about the polls at the moment, it does seem when you look at the tracking one. polls. Yeah. Pardon, yeah, there's still there's still a long way to go for people to believe that Keir Starmer is 
going to make a good prime minister. I mean, obviously, the Boris Johnson's ratings are precipitously yes. falling, but there does still seem to be quite a lot of said yet for Keir to travel. There's a, there's, there's a long gap between, you know, turning your back on this this government and actively choosing the Labour Party. Yeah. And I think, I mean, John's absolutely right about moving on to the economics, you know, and I, argue, I wrote a piece like this last week, arguing that's exactly what, you know, Labour has to be on to, the cost of living crisis, that is the whole cabinet and whoever is the next leader has their, their hands dipped in that. The thing that um, slightly worries me, it's completely um, overshadowed today by all the drama and excitement about Sue Gray, but we had a fair bit of drama in the NEC as well over the yeah. vote and the readmission or not of Jeremy Corbyn. Still have the Ford report to come out, still have God knows how many people who used to work for the Labour Party suing the rest of the Labour Party and countersuing each other um, about various things that happened under the last administration all of that has got to be dealt with at some point and all of that whereas I don't think we've talked about things that might put um Keir and Angela's relationship under strain I think that's one of them you know there are lots of internal party handling stuff still to be dealt with still costing the Labour Party an absolute fortune and you know that is going to require a lot of our old um loyalties being strained and a lot of stirring up all sorts of old resentments in the Labour Party that haven't gone away and you know that'd be literally the worst possible thing to do right now as the government is visibly tearing itself apart in front of you but it's got to be dealt with at some point it can't mm. just be shoved under the carpet because there's an election coming at some point in the next two years and someone needs to be I think convening um putting heads together in private and seeing whether some of those old lawsuits can't be settled or resolved. Mm. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I have seen that we're coming up to the end of this discussion, though I have more questions and wish it could have lasted longer and feel it's quite flown by. A massive thank you um, to Gabby, to John and to Michael for joining this evening. Usually people do a bit of a, a bit of a sum up of how the discussion's gone. I'm aware we've darted around a lot, but I think the general sentiment is that um, it's not a relationship that is harmed beyond repair by any means. And actually there's a great deal of potential in the Keir and Angela partnership and one which um, should the next weeks, months and years pan out could see could come to be um, one of the kind of really great political partnerships of our time. So um, I'm grateful for everybody for sharing their thoughts as well, both in the chat um, and here in the discussion too. I'm grateful again for our panelists for answering all of the questions that um, people had. and. Um, I would like, if possible, to um, ask you to come to Tomorrow's Sink In as well if you're if you're free. It's an open news special with Gail Smith, who's CEO of the One Campaign for Administration, uh, Administrator of the US Agency for International Development. And she's currently uh, the coordinator for the Global COVID Report and Health Security in the US State Department. So we're specifically going to be talking to her about her experiences kind of at the forefront of the American COVID response, but also uh, at the forefront of a topic that Tortoise cares uh, quite deeply about, which is that of um, vaccine inequality around the world. World, um, and the One Campaign have been um, kind of quite closely involved with Tortoise um, in trying to think about better ways to improve vaccine access uh, around the world, of which the US administration um, has obviously played quite a leading, although um, unfortunately as yet indecisive role. Um, so thank you so much for tonight. I feel I've um, learned a lot and have a lot more um, to think about and hopefully see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.